Gary concludes his series on the power of a promise today on Fixing the Money Thing. When God has given you already all things and has given you authority and power to live life by His grace, what excuse can you come up with? We believe you're stronger than you think. Be encouraged today on Fixing the Money Thing. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years we lived in a financial, chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, you're living like many of my people are, living in debt. He said, I want my people free. Your financial freedom is closer than you think. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. Financial problems, they're slow death. We're trying to change the way you think about money. This is Gary Cassie, Fixing the Money Thing. Welcome to another edition of Fixing the Money Thing. We're Gary and Jorinda Cassie again talking about your life and about how great God's promises are yes. in reference to allowing you to be something that you're not. Yes. They're, they're titled today. You're, you're stronger, stronger than you think. Than you think. <laughs> Amen. The grace of God in us makes us someone we're not. God plus us equals more than us. Totally. There's no way we could have done the things that we've done. Mm -hmm. I look back at our history and everything that we've come through. That's it's right. the grace of God. Amen. The grace of God has given us the ability because you believe you can through his strength. Well, Drenda, all week we've been talking about the promise of God, the power of the promise, and how God's promises produces the grace in us yes. to change our future. We have yes, emails coming in always. about this every it's week, awesome. so I want you to read one I love for it. us it's today. Encouraging. I joined Faith Life now as a partner, and within four days, I got checks totaling over $3,000 to bring in the cash flow for my immediate needs. It gets better. Uh, there was an application I had filled out for a TV show back in March, and the producers contacted me saying that they would like me to be on their show. Organizations who I sent my package to are now considering me to be a paid guest speaker for their conferences. There is so much more, but I will stop. I am so thankful for you and your ministry. May Father God continue to richly bless you and make his face shine upon you. I can't wait to see what happens next. That's right. And he ends it with expectation of abundance. And we can't wait to see what happens next with yes. you as well. Because you have promises. As you began to work with the grace of God, which is released in your life through the promises of God. Yes. You are stronger than you think. Yes. We taught this series for about a month at Faith Life Church, talking about the power of the promises of God. Let's go to a session there at Faith Life Church now and join the service already in progress. One of the things about being effective in the body of Christ and learning how to walk in the kingdom is forgetting half the stuff you learned growing up. Religion has trained us all kinds of faulty things. How about this one? You ever heard the prayer that uh, parents tell their kids as they go to sleep at night, now they lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I shall die or if you should die before you wake, I pray the Lord your soul to die. Can you imagine, honey, I just love you so much. Let's pray. Let's pray good night. I be on sleep. I pray that if you die tonight, the Lord will take your soul. I mean, a kid's eyes are going to go, sleep? I'm not going to sleep. <laughs> are you nuts? That prayer was a, quote, a children's prayer written in 1711. How about the song, Jesus Loves Me? That's a great song. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me. So that's awesome. Uh, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Okay, great song, but wrong ending. Sorry, we are not weak. He is strong, but because of his strength. Last time I checked, we are the body of Christ. If he's strong, we are strong, okay? So you pre you're programmed with all of this, I'm a worm, I'm going to heaven, thank God. How could God even love me? How could, I'm just, you know, how could he even love me? We're programmed with all this horrible self-image junk from religion. We have to change that. So let's start right now. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Paul is telling us who we are. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble 
or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written. For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, just a number of nothing, just a pawn to be used by God. That's what it said. Paul is quoting Psalms where Israel had backslidden and blamed God for all their trouble. But Paul says, he has to correct this. Let's put that next verse up, verse 37. He says, but what? No. Say it louder. No. no. So in trouble, are you, in this, are you going to just, just give up and weep and just carry on? No. no. In famine, you, you have lack in your family, you're just going to go, oh, poor is me. No. no. You know, in sickness, are you going to, oh, gee, it happens to everyone. No, because in all of these things we just mentioned, you are what? More, say the word more, than an overcomer. He's talking about who? No, me. I don't want this to not do it the general thing here, okay? You've got to get it, because us includes people that you think, well, they got it. You know, they're more spiritual than I am. And the Bible says you, you. He's talking about you sitting here today in that seat. He has made you more than an overcomer. We have just completed a series on the promises of God. Notice this is past tense. Remember we talked about the nature of God. God calls things that are not as though they are. He has legally given you the promises. You are more than an overcomer. Take a look at what Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians, the first chapter. And he had to make sure that he was setting the posture with this church He had to make sure they had this understanding in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remember you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. A light come on. You need to see something. He's saying you need to see something. Ever since I've heard about you coming to the Lord, I have prayed that you would see this. All right, see what? That you may see the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Whose inheritance is he talking about? Mine, ours, glorious inheritance. Imagine walking into a giant treasury room or whatever your vision of inheritance might be, but just imagine that it's glorious, so beyond what you anticipated that you just gasp. All right, number 19, and it's incomparably, nothing compares to his great power for who? Us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. This is referring to authority, the king's authority at the right hand of the father. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed, what, all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, which infers that everything we just read that he acquired is ours in him. Is that what the Bible says? Paul says, hey, the first thing you've got to know is you are not some nothingness. You are the body of Christ filled with his incomparable power that raised Jesus out of the grave. That kind of power that brought something dead alive, what excuse do you have? Is there anything harder than that? But that power is for us, the Bible says. That wisdom is for us, the Bible says. That authority, in second, uh, second chapter of Ephesians, verse number 6, it says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places, which means we are in the same position he is with the same authority on his behalf in the earth realm. Now that just changes a bunch of stuff. 
that kind of shuts down the whining, the complaining, the issues, because there really isn't any excuse. When God has given you already all things and has given you authority and power to live life by his grace, what excuse can you come up with? All right. First Corinthians chapter 1, Paul continues his discussion here. And we need to discuss this as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 22 says, Jews demand miraculous signs. Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the what? The power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Verse 26, pay attention. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Go back in history, Paul says. Think about where you were at. Not many of you were wise, inferring that you now are by human standards. Not many were influential, but that infers that he's saying, think about where you were. You had no influence, but now you do. Not many of noble birth, but now you have been born again by the very God himself and chosen by him. No one more noble than that. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, that be you. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong, that be you, previously. He's saying, think back how weak you were. Think back where you were at when you came to Christ. He chose the lowly things of this world and and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So what is he saying? You are called... You have a destiny to what? Demonstrate the power of God. Let me say it this way. You have a destiny to shame those who think in themselves they are strong. You have a destiny to bring shame to the wisdom that people think they stand in. What what would shame someone that has wisdom, a higher wisdom? What would shame someone that thinks they're strong to find someone stronger? Right? So you are in the, in the natural realm, limited, but God says in his realm, you're unlimited with his wisdom, his power to demonstrate, to demonstrate who he is. You with me? When I went to college, most of you know this, went to college, of course, in high school, I graduated at the nearest, there was one guy under me, I basically flunked out of high school. And so when God called me to go to college, I went to college, wrote a paper my first year in English class, and it came back with a big red F on it with the phrase, is it possible that you went to high school? (laughs) 20 years later, I received an email from that professor. Out of the blue. I saw you on TV. I saw you written some books. Is this the same Gary that was in my, is this the same Gary that was in my class? Back it over you. You see, God wants to take the weak, the foolish, the nothings, and He wants to make something out of them so that He gets the glory, that people see Him. And it's by His grace, His strength, that people see God. And they have to stand back and go, What? Is that is that really did that really happen? Hebrews chapter eleven, verse number thirty one. One more shall I say. Now Hebrews chapter eleven is the the hall of faith fame, all the people that did things that were impossible, okay, by faith. And what shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, meaning making it right, administering what is right, and gaining what was promised by faith. So let me just paraphrase this. You have the power by faith to change everything. Kingdoms infers the laws of government, how you live. You can change everything. Meaning that you can change, uh, you can administer justice 
Righteousness, what God says is right, into your situation. And you can gain what the promise says. You are supposed to have what the promises say. All the promises are yes and amen. You're supposed to have them all. All right, so people also shut the mouths of lions, quench the fury of the flames, and escape the edge of the sword. And what's the next phrase? Whose weakness was turned to strength. This is about you. The kingdom, the grace of God in you, the power of God that brought Jesus out of the grave, the wisdom of God is able to change you from that I can't do nothing to you can do all things. So stop saying that. Stop saying it. That's a lie. It is not true. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, and your weakness is not your destiny. Okay? The Bible says all things are new. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus, which means I have a new future that is not tied to my past. It's not tied to my daddy's last name. It's not tied to where I failed in the past. It's not tied to anything in my past. It's now tied to that glorious inheritance I now possess in Christ and the power of God that brought a dead person out of the grave. I'm still alive. I may, still, I may have a lot of death in me, learning in the earth realm, but if God can bring Jesus out of the grave, Lazarus out of the grave, he can bring me out of nothing to make something. There's no doubt about that. whose weakness was turned to strength. I don't like to hear people keep, keep practicing and rehearsing their weakness. Well, I've never done that well. I've never do this. And then you never will. Sorry. All right, so we have a destiny. God's destiny is he wants people to see him in you. You are his body. You're the only picture they see of God. If you're moping around, why do they want to join the team? If church isn't fun, then why do they want to come? If your life isn't any different, they might as well go down to the bar and get drunk, have a good time for the evening or whatever, you know. I mean, we are supposed to look different. Understand this. Paul said the most important thing I need to tell you since I heard of your faith in Christ is that the power of God is in you, for you. The wisdom of God is yours. The authority of Christ is yours. And so he is saying, it's all yours. Your life has been changed from the inside out. Now, speaking of the inside out, obviously there's a process that we need to submit to Christ and change. We can talk to this, uh, mention this scripture, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of you guys... If you, if you have uh, made a dress, let's say, if you actually are a seamstress, you make a dress and you don't like it and you keep using the same pattern over and over again, no matter how many times you use the same pattern, what happens? You have the same dress. So underline this in your mind. If you do not change how you think, tomorrow will be the same as yesterday. Let me say it again. You've got to understand this. You can wish all you want. You can pray all you want. Pastor, are you saying... You have to change how you think because it's you and God that are going to fight, face Goliath, not God by himself. And if you think, I can't, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of people, I don't want to talk to people, I don't want to make the sales call, I don't, I have, I'm limited, I'm just not that way, my personality's not that way, shut up. Spare us all the complaining, okay? We want people that are doing something. We want, I want to hang around people that are talking about dreams and visions and where they're going, not about their past failures all day. You know what I'm saying? Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. That word uh, transformed is from the Greek word morph, which means change. We get the word metamorphosis from that. So if you think of a caterpillar to a butterfly, your life in the caterpillar realm, the natural realm, is not supposed to look anything like that when God gets done with it. It's supposed to look like a, a butterfly. Butterflies a whole lot different. Butterflies are pretty, caterpillars are ugly. <laughs> you know, they have, they have these big glass buildings with butterfly exhibits. Not caterpillar exhibits, <laughs> butterfly exhibits. <laughs> yeah, and you wonder why no one's around your house watching your life because you're a caterpillar still. <laughs> I can't get going fast enough. Nothing's going to work. I could <laughs> Well, thank God for the cocoon. 
No, I'm serious. See, when we come to Christ, we enter into a cocoon phase. In the cocoon phase, and you need to understand this because you'll be tempted to quit. In the cocoon stage, from the outside, you, you see nothing, like nothing's, everything's changed. There's no caterpillar moving, no feeding, there's no butterfly, just this thing, just a leaf, just nothing, right? But inside the caterpillar, inside the cocoon, everything is changing. And at the right season, it bursts out into something that never has been, and people gasp. Oh my, that thing flies to Mexico. Look how beautiful and intricate it's made. How does it fly? It's so light and the wings and catch the breeze. You just marvel at these things that God made. The church is the cocoon that God uses to transfer, transform you from where you came from when you're trying to run all those legs as fast as you can run, trying to get anything done, to where God has got to get you to change to reach your destiny. In the cocoon, a caterpillar feeds on the plant it was born on. It stays on the plant. It was created to feed on that particular milkweed, that plant. It doesn't go very far. It just feeds on that plant, content with the knowledge, if you will, of what it's doing. And that's just to eat. Just got to eat. I just got to feed. And then from the inside, it has a a natural process where it knows the timing to create a cocoon when it's never made one before. Doesn't even know how to make one. I mean, it's never done it before. Nor has it flown to Mexico before. It's never been there before. Yet something inside it starts to create this beautiful thing from the inside out. And at the right season, it bursts out and flies. So two things. Take responsibility. But be encouraged that you're in the cocoon process. Many of you are tired. Well, I don't see any change. Stay plugged in. Feed on the word. Be convinced that God's promises are yes and amen for you. At the right time, as you feed, you continue to change from the inside out. And that inside out is going to eventually burst out and your life is going to take on more and more of the character of Christ. Just don't give up. Give up. God will get it there, but you have to stay involved. 